Hello and welcome to Foreign Policy Focus, episode 31. I am the show's host, Kyle. I just want to first thank all my listeners who are sharing the show and who are uh, rating and reviewing the show on iTunes. I've noticed that those uh, both have been occurring a lot and it is really helping the show to grow. So thank you everybody who is doing that. Uh, if you could continue to do that, that will be really helpful. For those of you who haven't yet, I mean, spread the word. Uh, foreign policy is a big issue. There's not a whole lot of people out there talking about this. I, I think I do a pretty good job on this show of explaining the issue. So if you want other people to understand understand how America's foreign policy is really killing Americans and really hurting America, then uh, let them know. Either way, let's jump right into the news. I first want to talk about this study I found uh, that looked at who the American people felt were their enemies. They have several questions uh, that, and most of them I think are irrelevant and kind of goofy, but this one question I think is really important, and that is, do you consider the country listed to be a friend or enemy of the United States? Uh, and then these are the percentage total of Americans who felt that this spe- specific country was an enemy of uh, America. North Korea was the highest at 57%. Iran was second at 41%. Russia had 22% of Americans say they saw them as an enemy. Uh, Saudi Arabia, 16% said enemy and 10% said ally and 25% said friendly. So, uh, man, that, that's one that I just don't quite understand. Iraq at 4, 29%, uh, Syria at 32%, Libya at 20%, Venezuela at 9%, Cuba at 9%, and Somalia at 20%. We also have Afghanistan at 23%, Pakistan at 19%, UAE at 11%, Yemen at 14%, Egypt at 3%, Palestine at 18%, Israel actually got 5%, and uh, I think that about rounds it up for the notable countries, uh, especially in the Middle East. So we can, there, I mean, there's a lot of important observations we can make from those numbers, but I think the first is that only North Korea scores over uh, 50%. So North Korea is the only country that a majority of Americans view as en- their enemy. And I, I mean, I think this is a very important way to, to look at some things. First of all, uh, just, just the difference between the United States of America government labeling a country an enemy and the country being viewed as the enemy of the American people uh, could, you know, constitute republic that we have in the United States is really set up to where that, uh, you know, declarations of war have to pass the House of Representatives, which is supposed to be the, the body that is representative of the people. And so it's hard to imagine how you could end up in a situation where you're going to war with countries and, or at, putting sanctions on country or at least, you know, advocating for war against countries when only a quarter of the people so support such an action uh with war being such an important issue right because this is this is what you know if you're an an older american this is what you're willing to send your children to die for if you're uh you know a millennial now you probably are the people that are going and fighting and dying in these wars and so let, let's take syria for example where 32 percent of the american people see see syria as a as an enemy as their enemy um so one one third, roughly, of, of the American people see uh, Syria, the Syrian government, as a, and their enemy. Yet Trump is bombing them. It d- doesn't this seem odd that at least two thirds of the congressmen you would think would happen to lose their congressional seats next time around, right? If uh, so many Americans don't feel that Syria is their enemy, yet the U.S. is bombing Syria, that that should be a major cause for concern of the American people. I think this indicates one how kind of a, like I talked about in the last show. Uh, uh, the consequences of, of the air wars, really, and how America does these sneaky air wars, and the American people don't feel it because it's mostly paid through through the hidden tats of inflation. But when very few soldiers are dying, American people don't really care if their government bombs uh, a country, even if they don't view that country as an enemy. Yeah, Syria, you know, Assad's never going to do anything to America. And, uh, well, it's, you know, maybe would be better if, uh, you know, Assad was in charge because Assad definitely won't do anything to America. And if Assad's not in charge, ISIS might be in charge and they may do something to America. But, uh, you know, I have to vote for Hillary Clinton or I have to vote for Donald Trump because we need to build a wall or we need more uh, education or food stamps or something silly like this, right? Like the attention the American voter really pays to important issues is, is just so low. The, the, the decisions on whether we decide that it's okay to kill people 
de- declaring even an air war. The decisions to spend trillions of dollars uh, mortgaging the the future generations of America to fight in a war. The 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 mortgaging of, of the futures of so many Americans who go and die in these wars is such a small priority to to so many American voters. It's really disgraceful, and I think this study should uh, be in one way uh, a shining light to say that most of Americans do at least in, in some form have the same uh, a view of the world or have a view of the world the non-interventionist can uh, foreign policy can conform to we could say hey look you don't view all these countries as an enemy we really shouldn't be in war there right and I think that you know is a way especially when we leverage on the other side saying like hey there's all this like moral decay that occurs from war and uh, so many people die and we waste so much money and look man i know you really care about uh abortion or uh, uh health care or whatever but at the end of the day eventually we somebody has to cast a vote for um for for non-interventions and, and you know you can't always ignore the war issue say hey hey you know vote for whoever you want for president but at least vote a congressman in who who will hold the congressional war powers in check Maybe a message like this could be somewhat useful, but at the end of the day, I think this is just important. Uh, the other, I guess, results from the survey that were so interesting to me was Iraq and Syria almost have identical results. And I think this goes to show, one, just how misinformed the American people are about foreign policy. I mean, the U.S. government is paying the Iraqi, uh, it's probably spending you know billions and billions every year to prop up that government, right? We're spending billions of dollars on a government that a a big percentage of the american people believe is the enemy of ours and then if you go across the board to syria you have only 32 percent so only three percent more of americans view syria as an enemy than do uh iraq and then we're bombing that government and so i mean it's always insane what what the american foreign policy is but it did this just seems to really sh- cast the light on and again it's kind of the similar thing with afghanistan where it's only nine percent between florida than syria at 23 percent the u.s government is probably the only thing keeping that government afloat i find it funny that more americans view saudi arabia as an enemy of theirs over yemen of course it was i believe 16 saudi arabian hijackers on 9-11 and i don't know if there are any yemeni hijackers on 9-11 but we're we're fighting a war in Yemen on the side of Saudi Arabia and uh, more Americans view Saudi Arabia as an enemy than do Yemen. And so you would think that the, if there was pressure for uh, the United States to stay size in the war would obviously be on the Yemeni side against Saudi Arabia since so they're a bigger enemy of the American people, but that's not how anybody looks at it. I, I find, I guess, Libya is kind of an interesting one because there's really not a government in Libya right now. It's just a bunch of warlords running all over and, you know, some... Ed's General Haftar, who was a CIA man at one point, owns like a third of the country, and some UN vet government owns some portion of the country, and a bunch of jihadists control part of the country. But uh, the, the Americans see Libya as the enemy of the United States, and, and it's like, I I don't even know what is Libya. It, I mean, Libya went with Gaddafi, so it, it's really insanity. I guess any country that America goes to war with is probably going to get twenty percent of the vote, just based on the fact that there's twenty percent of Americans who say, "Well, they have to be our enemy if uh, we're at war with them." But I, I think the most important part is uh, the numbers are on our side. Uh, most people don't view. Uh, these countries as enemies of ours and if we can say hey if you don't view them as our enemy we have to ask uh, our government not to be at war with them and uh, it seems like we have the overwhelming majorities in our favor to make that argument the the last point we'd like to make on that is just russia and china scoring uh you know 11 percent for china and 22 percent i believe for russia uh these are the two major uh nuclear superpowers in the world and if so many americans don't see them as enemies then why can't we be friends I bet Hillary Clinton wish she saw these poll numbers before she tried to turn Putin and the Russians into the enemy of the American people. And even after she did that, it still only scores 22%. So I, I think it's, you know, as bad as it is and as much as our government leads us into getting into, you know, these potential conflicts with these superpowers, at least we have the majority of American citizens with some enough understanding to know that these people aren't our enemies. But while the people don't see each other as enemies and are just trying to get by day to day, the governments of the world are spending more on defense. Uh, defense spending is up 
2016 as compared to 2015. Of course, it seems like there's more wars breaking out, more hostility going on uh, right now than in the past. So, I mean, it's certainly a disturbing trend. Uh, If you really think about it, it... Money spent on defense is really money that doesn't go to productive use. You could say, yeah, you know, having having a gun in your home is productive because there's all these bad people in the world. But when you're building aircraft carriers, you're not feeding anyone. You're not making anybody's lives better or anything like that. You're just building weapons. And, I, I mean, the purpose of the weapon is either to be destroyed or to detroit, destroy something else. And uh, it, at the end, it, it's all it's all about destruction. It nets nobody any benefit, uh, really, at the end of the day. Where if you're spending money, at least if you're spending money designing computers or something, uh, you're, you're spending it on things that are going to make everybody's life better. Moving over to Europe, we have... France uh, having a runoff election between Marcon and Le Pen. Uh, I, I guess from the non-interventionist perspective, uh, Le Pen does seem to be the better candidate. I believe she even came out and criticized Trump for his uh, actions in Syria against Assad. So I think it is beneficial that we do have uh, major candidates uh, running for heads uh, of you know, major world world powers uh, that do have a somewhat non-interventionist foreign policy. Although I do think it comes from a position of uh, right-wing nationalism and not nationalism and not non-interventionist philosophy. So I think the risk you run is that when whenever you elect someone on the nationalist uh, policy, like the American First policy, over the non-interventionist uh, policy, then you you're more likely to end up with a Trump. Where if you would have elected Ron Paul, you know Ron Paul would have never bombed Assad in Syria and so this is a difference that if you're American first if you're the you know I I believe in defending the homeland and you know we shouldn't be wasting all this money overseas and all all that you know all those non-interventionist arguments that are really good that the American firsters make at the end of the day they can always be scared into bombing another country and that really doesn't violate their core principles of of the American firsterism. It seems like uh, this Marcon fellow is a pretty socialist type of guy, and uh, I, I mean, I don't know where he stands on foreign policy. He's probably not as bad as Trump, but he's probably not as good as Le Pen. Moving uh, to the UN, we have Saudi Arabia being elected to the UN Commission on Women's. I guess this is going to kind of evaluate women's rights around the world and all that other stuff. I I mean, I don't know what else you need to, to see uh, the UN as a joke that just provides Saudi Arabia political cover to commit atrocities countries that have sanctions against them uh if some by some by the un uh like iran or uh i know u.s has sanctions on russia i think there are some u.n sanctions on north korea and things like this and uh those regimes certainly do bad things uh, i i won't you know sit behind this microphone and defend the iranian regime and say oh well the people there are living in a paradise i could say you know comparatively it's better to have uh rohadi in power over ahmadinejad but that's not necessarily a a a, a, you know stamp of approval for for the iranian government and when you look at that like spectrum saudi arabia certainly falls into the list of countries that treats the citizens fairly poorly i don't think they actually stone gay people to death anymore but they certainly don't approve of homosexuality women's rights in saudi arabia are very restrictive and um i I mean i know there's been some protesting and some reforms but you see news stories coming out like kids getting arrested for being provocative online or something ridiculous like this and so it's really a, a repressive society if any american went there and tried to live under those rules i i think they would be pretty disgusted and, and probably very annoyed by them and so this is you know a case where if you do have the un and you're trying to say that our mission is to you know make the world a better place then at least have the courage to stand up for your principles and condemn saudi arabia for doing things wrong it's especially the war in yemen where their strategy is to starve the you know poor yemeni babies to death and to make the parents submit that way However, you have the UN covering for Saudi Arabia's murder of children in Yemen, and now you have them essentially uh, approving Saudi Arabia's treatment of women by putting them on this, you know, important commission evaluating the the rights of women. Uh, is it's laughable and stupid one atrocity uh that could be maybe prevented somewhat but uh likely will not be thanks to uh president trump in the united states of america and that is uh an escalation of war in somalia could lead to famine in somalia 
Well, the the situation is that the worst areas in Somalia, the areas that are most likely to see famine, are the areas that are controlled by the terrorist jihadist group Al-Shabaab that rose from American interventionism in Somalia. Uh, I did an episode on this. I'm not sure which episode. Uh, I could try to find that and post it just so everybody uh, has a little bit of the background of Somalia. But there was a uh, Islamic courts council that consisted of many groups. The uh, Americans bet the Ethiopians coming in and killing off all of those groups, but the youth group Al-Shabaab, uh, and that's where the uh, group came from that you know, swore alliance to, I believe, Osama bin Laden and is now mostly loyal to Ayman al-Zahiri, but some are loyal to Baghdadi. And there's a little bit of a Al-Shabaab-ISIS conflict in Somalia, but I don't think it's as major as, you know, you see in Syria, and they probably mostly fight together. And the area controlled by this terrorist group, Al-Shabaab, is the area that the U.S. is looking at going into because they, they you know, Al-Shabaab's a terrorist group and Lockheed needs to use some missiles. So, uh, you know, one plus one equals two, war with Somalia. If we do end up going through with this war, uh, there's looming famine in these areas, especially in the areas controlled by Al-Shabaab. So whenever you start dropping bombs on places, it makes it really hard to get humanitarian aid in. A lot of the, you know, humanitarian aid workers are people from Western countries and as much as they want to help the people if the u.s has a war on we may prevent them we may say uh you know we can't risk all these trucks driving around because they could be shipping weapons or bombs to uh you know for al-shabaab or something like that or you know dropping the food in the these areas will likely help al-shabaab so uh we're not gonna let you do this or the groups will just think it's too risk uh if the u.s is dropping bombs on big trucks rolling around and then you're rolling around in a big truck your you know your truck might get bombed so that's an awfully terrible thing to have you know happen when you're just trying to deliver deliver food to some people and help some people out so it looks like if the u.s does decide to go through with its at least suggested military action in somalia trump really hasn't said what he's gonna do he just gave the military more authority to bomb in uh south somalia by declaring in an area of hostility so uh it, it looks like we're going to be increasing war in in somalia but i mean who knows but if we do it, it really rich famine so I think we really had there, there's a good case to be made here for the non-interventionist uh, one we have the Black Hawk Down situation occurring under Clinton and do we you know maybe we can make arguments saying look look how terrible went this went the last time we were here do we really want to go back to this country it seems like kind of a hellhole anyways and it, it would be nice if we could go in and make everything the way we want it but is it really worth Americans dying for and also we could you know try to say like hey if America does go in there may be a famine here and a lot of people are going to die in that certain not going to look good for America on their national stage. Plus, it's really bad when a lot of people die because of America, so shouldn't we just not do this? I think if you're, uh, you know, you care about this issue and you would like to see something done about it, make the calls now. If the U.S. government starts a war in Somalia or increases the war in Somalia to put more ground troops, it's much harder to scale it down than to scale it up. Uh, we could put up more resistance when we try and scale it up. Once there's already a couple thousand U.S. troops in the country, I, what can you do at that point, really? Uh, unfortunately, at, at that point, then it would mean losing a war to pull out because you're never going to win one of these Middle Eastern wars. And, and you know, Trump's never going to lose a war. So, uh, you know, things get disastrous quickly. With uh, civilian deaths being a subject I'm talking about, I move our attention to the ISIS war in Iraq and Syria. We have a report coming out uh, based on Air Wars data showing that the number of civilians dying in this war is uh, still on the rise. More people died in March than in February, uh, etc. It's looking it's looking like Trump had r loosened restrictions in this area. I think I detailed on Friday's show how... Um, you do have a situation now where the U.S. is bombing areas that there's just less uh, wealthy people in these areas. Uh, places in, in West Mosul are just not as wealthy as places in East Mosul that was already liberated. So maybe America can just be a little bit more liberal about the bombing here. Uh, I don't know exactly why, but you know this is just something we need to know about and keep our eyes on. In Syria, we have Israel bombing uh, a Syrian position, killing three militia members. Uh, three pro-Assad militia members were killed by Israel. 
I think this just kind of goes to show that Israeli policy in Syria seems to be towards taking out Assad. Still, I guess some stray rocket fire ended up in Israel uh, from the fighting going on in Syria where they do share a border. So it's not surprising you would see this. I think it's happened before, but it's always the uh, Syrian troops that seem to get bombed by Israel. It seems Israel's policy in Syria is just to prolong the war as much as, as long and as much as possible. And the best way to do that now is to pick on Assad because it looks like he's winning previous episodes i detailed reports put out by theodore postal who is an mit scientist uh who who came out and debunked the 2013 chemical weapons attack in syria and really did a good job debunking the chemical weapons attack in syria this time as well I just want to point out that he put out a, sec- a third article saying that he made an error, I believe, in the second article saying that he misinterpreted wind directions and uh, reworked the data. As it turns out, the data still shows that the U.S. White House report that was put out on uh, the, the Syrian chemical weapons attack is still wrong and leads to false conclusions. So uh, important for all of us to know that the government is still lying and that uh, somebody with integrity, Theodore Postal, corrects his errors and gives us the honest truth i would also like to point out i don't think i've done this on the show before but it's important to do that the uh that the report that trump used to take the action against assad in syria that white house report wasn't put out by the intelligence communities it was put together by the white house and uh this happened in the i believe in the 2003 report too excuse me 2013 intelligence or or, uh, white house report that said the syrian uh syrian government carried out weapon or chemical weapons attack and so uh it it always seems like whenever the government can't get the intelligence agencies to lie to us they just put together their own lie while mass was speaking in saudi arabia he informed us that he believes that assad still has chemical weapons uh i don't think that this is true it seems to me that he would have given his weapons to putin whenever uh in two 2013 and this was a way he kept from being bombed by obama i'm sure that if assad did have chemical weapons i i I don't think putin would be very happy because he kind of vouched for assad on the international stage they didn't have chemical weapons assad really has no need to use chemical weapons he's uh pretty clearly gonna win that war so long as the u.s doesn't get involved so uh it really seems that if you know the the if you're good, just going to go with the simplest explanation, that's that Assad doesn't have chemical weapons. And so if you're going to claim that he does, you might need to prove, you know, provide some proof for that claim. In Afghanistan, we have 140 Afghani army uh, members being killed by the Taliban in a suicide attempt. I believe this was in northern uh afghanistan that the the attack occurred there are reports that there were some u.s military personnel at the base i don't know if that's true but i i think you know once again this just goes to the complete show the complete futility of the america war effort in afghanistan we it's our longest war we've been there 15 years to spend nearly a trillion dollars it, it, it's it's simply utterly unwinnable there's nothing we could do uh it, it's time to go home We have Mattis also speaking and telling us that the U.S. may increase support for Saudi Arabia in Yemen. Uh, Trump had looked for Saudi Arabia to have some kind of pledge that they'll try not to kill so many Yemeni civilians with the bombs we give them. However, you know, there's there's no measurable thing there. So, I, you know, I doubt that anything's going to change or or anything like that. And it just would be an empty promise from Saudi Arabia. And Trump would know that, but it would give him the political cover to sell the weapons. Maybe. I don't know. But, uh, I mean, it just goes to show Trump's utter, uh, I guess... It really just goes to show Trump's complete uh, un- understanding of the whole situation going on in the Middle East. Uh, if you want to help the Yemeni civilians now, you got to tell them not to uh, go after the poor of Adiah. Uh, it seems like if U.S. will increase support for Saudi Arabia in Yemen, it will be to carry out the mission to take that port. Once this happens, all those babies who are barely getting by on the food they can find are probably going to start starving. And so uh, we got to urge the Trump administration not to do it. Uh, tell our congressmen to go through. Uh, 50 of them wrote a letter to Trump saying, if you want to escalate there, you got to get our approval. There's no way the Congress will get their approval, I hope, because only 14% of Americans see Yemen, the Yemen, the Yemen people as their uh, enemy. And, you know, 16% see Saudi Arabia as enemy. So it seems like... Uh, if you know you're a congressman, uh, it'd be a pretty prudent decision to make to decide not to go after uh, Yemen and support Saudi Arabia more. But I, you know, who knows? But I think our best chance is for it to go to a vote. 
All right, that wraps up my show for today. If you like the show, please share the show. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, whatever you got. Tell people you like it and that it's a cool show. Uh, tell them to you know, get them informed on foreign policy so we go to make some changes one day. Join my Facebook group, Foreign Policy Focus. Like my Facebook page, Kyle's Files. My personal website where I do news roundups plus post all my podcasts is kylesfilesblog.com. Files spelled F-Y-L-E-S. The, fa- the webpage for the podcast is foreignpolicyfocus.libsyn.com uh, check out I do I post on the blog at uh, the Libertarian Institute so you can always check that out follow me on Twitter at K-Y-A-A-L-E thanks everybody see you uh, Wednesday <laughs>